This is the Library of Celsus. It's one of the three great libraries in the world. Alexandria, Pergamum, Celsus. And here we are in Ephesus, ancient Ephesus. This, of course, had fallen down. The archaeologists put it back up. It is absolutely a marvelous thing and one of the great structures of the ancient world that's been put back and it's intact. It's absolutely glorious. These arches behind over here, we're going to be doing a study under these arches very shortly uh, that will actually open up a huge portion of Scripture for you. Not only some of the letters of Revelation, but one of the great mysteries in the book of Revelation, which to the people at this time was no mystery. Meanwhile, we're now at the location of the first letter where Jesus actually dictates the letter to John. Remember, keep in mind who is telling this to John. We say, well, it's Jesus. No, wait a minute. Think about how Jesus has portrayed himself to John. Remember, like the, like the ancient of days looking like the father, as it were. He's got white hair and the face like shining like the sun, eyes like flames of fire, the white robe down to his ankles, the sash of gold across his chest, feet like bronze glowing in a furnace, holding in his right hand the seven stars of the seven angels of the churches. And out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. And he's moving around these golden lampstands, each one burning away, each one representing one of the seven churches, in heaven before the presence of God. And that means God is looking at the churches. He's looking over them. Jesus is. He's moving in the midst of the churches. And so he says, John, now listen, write this down. And so John does. And it's in Revelation chapter 2. It says, to the angel of the church at Ephesus write, Jesus speaks. Your words are all in red here. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Here's what he says. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know what you're doing. You're working hard, and you're sticking to it. You have not let up. In other words, you've gone on and on. Perseverance. When, when we get to heaven, we find that our reward, and we'll talk about this when we get to Corinth, but our reward, we are rewarded for perseverance and faithfulness. Sticking to it and faithfulness to God during this time we're sticking to it, why we're sticking to the work that he's given us to do. That's where your reward comes from, but we'll have more about that later. I know you cannot tolerate wicked men. What kind of wicked men? That you have tested those who claim to be apostles and are not, and have found them false. There are false apostles. There were in those days. They would go around with a false message. They would do it in order to garner um, to themselves uh, disciples. And when you had disciples, <laughs> you had money. Not like Jesus. We're talking about people that actually did this to exploit money from the people. Like traveling philosophers that they had in those days. They would go around and they would come into a city and they would philosophize and then they would pass the hat. So these guys are coming in saying they are apostles, but they don't know what they're talking about. They're not apostles. They're making their doctrine up as they go, so to speak. And so Jesus says, these are wicked men. Why? Why wicked? They're misrepresenting God badly. They're drawing people away from the salvation where God is constantly trying to draw people in. He's drawing people. These guys are drawing people away. He said, you've tested them. You found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. These hardships is what we're going to talk about later, but we've already mentioned them when we talked about Smyrna. Remember, we're taking our churches out of the order in which they're in here in the Bible because that happened to be the order of our travel, and it made it a lot easier to do it that way. But the perseverance, the hardships that they had to endure, a lot of problems. Problems from the Jews that opposed Jesus. Not all Jews did, of course, but the ones that did, that were very militant, caused tremendous hardships. Not only that, but further, and probably a lot worse, was Caesar worship, which we'll be talking about again later, too. Caesar worship was what caused a lot of the Christians to be persecuted because, as I said before, if you don't worship Caesar properly, you're worshiping a god, a deity, then the deity will get mad, bring an earthquake, a fire, a flood, a famine, a drought, whatever, and it's all your fault because you didn't do it right, and then everybody gets mad at you because you wouldn't worship the God properly. Verse 4, that all sounds fine and good, and it's like Jesus says, this is great, except for one thing. I hold this against you. I wouldn't want to hear Jesus say those words to me. You're doing really, really good, but 
Oh, man. That one word. I hold this against you. You have forsaken, or if you read the ESV, the English Standard Version of the Bible, you have abandoned. It's a very, very proper word to use. You have abandoned your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Now, this is where things get a little strange. Because I have heard and given sermon after sermon after sermon on this point. Whether I was teaching through the book of Revelation or whether I just needed to speak about the, sermon, uh, the subject as a sermon. Leaving or abandoning or forsaking your first love. What is your first love? See, this is the operative word in this entire letter. If you don't know what that is, we miss the point. Well, to us, in our romantic Western culture, our first love is, oh, your first romance. But see, that's not the way these people thought. That's not what's going on in here at all. Jesus is speaking to them their language. And I'm not talking about their vocabulary as such. I'm talking about they understand what he says. Remember, when the book of Revelation shows up here in Ephesus, which presumably is the first port of call for the book of Revelation, it comes here first from Patmos, that they read this and they understand exactly Jesus' point. You have abandoned your first love. You're doing everything right. You've got good works. You're resisting the pressure. You're standing strong. You persevered against, against Caesar worship and all of this, but you've abandoned your first love. First thing you can note is that this is a church that is extremely good procedurally, ceremoniously, however you want to put it. They are doing everything right which here's Jesus' criticism of them. You can be and do church really, really well. But he said, you are not my church if you don't have the love that I specify. You've left that behind. In other words, no love, no church. That's a strong statement. No love, no church. That's what he threatens Ephesus with. These people, this church right here. What does that love look like? That's the question. Look, I'm going to read you two passages of Scripture, one of which you need to memorize, and I'll tell you how you're going to do it. It's John 3.16. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, I'm sorry, I left out one word. 1 John 3.16. First John 3.16. 3.16. See, you can remember it, right? Listen to this. 1 John 3.16. Why am I going there instead of John 3.16? John wrote Revelation, the Gospel of John, and 1 John. They're all the same author. So you can imagine, if Jesus is speaking to John, John is writing this down, the commonality of his definition of love is coming straight from Jesus, and it's in all of his writing. Here's what he says in 1 John. 316. This is how we know what love is. Okay, this is what they abandoned. You ready? This is what they left. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? These people were easy at discerning truth from error, right from wrong, false apostles from true apostles, and what have you. But now Jesus is saying, that's good, but that's not the point. It's not good enough. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? That's your first love. See, we, our first love is like what we have a romantic relationship with. No, it's a demonstration that we know that Jesus <laughs> loved us and we love in the manner in which he loved us. And he demonstrated that, of course, in John chapter 13, where he washed the disciples' feet. That's a whole other sermon, but I think you understand that one well enough. Dear children, 
John continues, let us not love with words or tongue. We're a loving church. We say we are. But with actions and truth, that's what love is. Remember, agape love is not sentiment. It's not a supercharged phileo. In other words, a supercharged fondness for another person. This is what allows Christians to love their enemies. They don't have to be fond of them. They just have to do good to them, the good that God would have them do. Do good to those who hate you. Not do good to those who hated you, but like you now. Not do good to those who hate you, but you like them. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who are harming you. If anyone has material possessions, he says, brother in need has no pity on him. How can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us love with words, not, not, with, not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know we belong to the truth, how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Now look. He has just defined love. It's what you do for others. Jesus defined it by lowering himself below his apostles, his disciples, and washing their feet. He's the greatest in the universe. He went below his own guys who had really messed up ideas about him at the time, and he still became as a foot-washing servant or slave to them. And then he said to them, now you do to each other what I have done to you. Wash each other's feet. A servant is not greater than his master, and the messenger greater than the one who sent him. And that's me, Jesus was saying. Now, if you do these things, you will be. And they would think, oh, that would be horrible. I would be just absolutely offended. No. He said, you do these things to each other. Wash each other's feet. Get below each other to lift each other up. Take care of the poor. Take care of each other. Minister to each other's needs. Have compassion on each other. Loving your enemies and all of that. You are actually, truly loving each other as I have loved you. And that could take a billion different forms, but it all involves going below the lower person and lifting them higher. That's your love. Paul takes it to another level. When over in, of all the perfect places, the book of Ephesians, Paul prays for the Ephesians. And what he says for them is absolutely spectacular, where he says in chapter 3, verse 14 of the book of Ephesians, where Paul wrote to this, this is not John, this is Paul, wrote to these people here, this church here, before Jesus dictated this letter to John. This happened decades before Jesus dictated this letter to John. This is what Paul prayed for. Listen to this. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. This is his prayer. From whom the whole family of believers in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray, listen, here it is, that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you, Ephesians. Oh, uh, did I remind you? You're the church in Ephesus today. You're it. Here you are. That he may strengthen you, church, with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in, in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That's the first love as well. That's the love of Christ. We'll back over into Revelation here and we wrap this up. As Jesus is dictating, he said, repent from the height you have fallen. This is the height. Height is not having a well-organized church, a well-oiled machine. It's not having all the right lights and the right sound systems and the fog machines and the fantastic worship team. A church is a loving church or it is no church, period. End of subject. That's it. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. It's right here. And he gets very, very stern about it because, as I said, Jesus said, that he said, if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Where is this lampstand? In heaven, in the presence of God. You may still operate as a building and as an organization, but you have no place in my presence, he's telling them. This is really harsh, and rightfully so. It's not only harsh, it's perfect. But you have this in your favor, you hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. We're not going to talk about them today either. We're going to talk about them when we get to one of our next churches.
said this. Then Jesus, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, you beat this one. You have victory over all of this. You, the victory is over your own problem, your own bad attitude, your own, your own uh, fallen from this height of love for one another. You overcome this. You start loving one another again. You just go back to it. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. That's a very interesting statement, but it's something that the people here could very, very easily picture. You see, that big temple, the temple of Artemis of the Ephesians, that everyone here, including the Christians, knew about, was over in that direction on the other side of this hill, about a mile away. And over there, there was, near the temple, a sort of an orchard, a, an agricultural area that was called the Garden of Paradise. And it was dedicated to Artemis of the Ephesians. Jesus said, look, you beat this one, and you can eat from the tree of life in the presence of me, of God. And he didn't say these words, but you find in the end of the book of Revelation, it happens to be in the new Jerusalem. That would be the heaven that we are going to spend the rest of eternity in. And from there out, whatever God has us do at that time as we serve him into all eternity, that glorious time. This is the letter to the Ephesians, the first letter that Jesus dictates to John. Remember, our love is not how we feel, it's what we do that pleases God, that's assigned to us by God, that's empowered to us by His Holy Spirit in order to look upon others and say, as we talked about before, having that good eye where I look at others and say, what is it that they need that God has provided me with to bless them with? And it can be material, it can be spiritual, it can be emotional. Comfort. God is the God of compassion, the compassionate and gracious God. Your first love. Don't leave it. And the good news in all of this is, well, if you lose something, you don't know where to find it. If you leave something, you know exactly where to go back to get it. They had left their first love. Amen and amen. All right.